Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our third episode of our gardening series. Um, we will be starting just in a minute, and I'm going to go ahead and go over some housekeeping notes. Um, my name is Erin McKinley. For those who are uh, just joining the session, uh, I am the Reader Engagement Manager here at Bay Area News Group. You might recognize me from a few months ago. Uh, I used to host these, and then I went on maternity leave. So I am back uh, and happy to join everyone again. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Remember that if you do have any questions, please go ahead and submit them in the Q&A function. Um, or if you just want to chat and say hello, go ahead and use that chat feature. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and then if you guys are looking to uh, register for any of our upcoming events, make sure that you guys go to uh, our events page at mercurynews.com slash events, eastbaytimes.com slash events, or marinij.com slash events. Uh, and you'll be able to not only register for the upcoming uh, webinars, but you'll also be able to see some of our past webinars. I know a lot um, of our folks here, especially for the gardening part, want to learn about what we've talked about before. And there you can find all of the recording links. Um, so I think we're gonna probably just go ahead and get started. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce to you our uh, speaker for today is actually gonna be uh, our Bay Area News Group Features Editor, Jackie Burrell. So Jackie, go ahead, take it away. Thank you so much and welcome everybody. Um, I'm filling in today for Joan Morris, who is unfortunately a little under the weather. She's fine. I know she has a big fan base there. So just wanna reassure you, she's fine. She'll be back. Um, so you've got me and I am joined today by Susan Morrison. Um, as Erin mentioned, I'm the senior features editor for the Mercury News and the East Bay Times. We cover arts and entertainment, uh, restaurants, wine, travel in non-pandemic times, lots of hiking right now, um, gardening, wildlife, every, every kind of lifestyle thing. It's a, it's a great gig. Um, we've got with us today Susan Morrison, who's the owner and founder of Creative Exteriors Landscape Design and author of The Less Is More Garden, Big Ideas for Designing Your Small Yard. So that is perfect for today's topic, which is how to make um, even a small space beautiful. Lush can be little, in other words. Um, we're going to be doing something a little bit differently today than we've done in past webinars um, because landscape is such a visual thing. Um, after I introduce the lovely Susan, she's going to be doing a, a presentation and then we'll do questions at the end. So if you have any questions um, along the way, just hit the Q&A button and type them in there and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, Susan has, uh, is here in the East Bay. She's an expert in all things gardening. Um, she's a landscape designer who designs everything from large estate gardens to itty bitty postage stamp size courtyards and patios. Susan, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Well, first of all, hi everyone. And thank you for being here to chat with me today. Uh, I have been a designer in the East Bay for almost 20 years and I am in the hot part of East Bay. So I mostly design gardens in Walnut Creek and Concord and Danville and Lafayette, places like that. And you really, I don't think you can be a designer in the Bay Area and not develop some level of expertise in small gardens because that's really what so many of us have. But in addition to designing, I also am a writer. So I have written articles on the topic, mostly for Fine Gardening Magazine, but for others as well. And I also have a couple of books. And my most recent book is called The Less Is More Garden, Big Ideas for Designing Your Small Yard. Um, in addition to that, I also speak on the topic. And I do that mostly here in the Bay Area, but in other parts of the country as well. And in fact, just earlier this week, I reported a presentation for the Fred Meyer Sculpture Garden in Michigan. And they were really lovely to work with. But I have to tell you, I was thinking about this this morning. It's always just really nice to be here with my own people where we all speak the same language when it comes to sun and water and things like that. So thank you for having me. And I would say probably the only other thing that I would add is that um, locally, I'm also a master gardener. So I might have seen you around our test gardens um, in the past. That's pretty much it for me. So Jackie, I'm ready for you to ask me a question. You bet. I feel very confident in saying that we will be not, there will be no questions today about snow gardening or a blizzard care. 
Um, over the next 90 minutes, the half hour we've got here with you, lovely headliners, and then the hour after with everybody, we're going to be addressing all sorts of issues concerning small space gardening. I guess one of the big questions certainly that I have is um, what are some of the common mistakes people make when designing their garden spaces, especially small ones? Well, uh, that is a good question, and small gardens do have some, some specific challenges to them, but one of the things that people sometimes um, do in a way that's not the best way is they tend to just jump right into the process. And it's really important to do some upfront planning. And when I say that, sometimes people think that I mean, well, we've got to start a laundry list of things that we want to include and that we don't want to include. But the reality is, is that the first place to start isn't what is going to go into my garden, but what am I going to be doing in my garden? And what am I doing now that I could be enhancing that experience? Or what am I not doing at all but that I would like to be? So that upfront planning, that kind of, you know, determining what garden elements are best for your lifestyle is very important. And I'm not gonna go into that too much, partly because just so the headliners know, this particular uh, session is gonna be a little bit different than what you've seen before in that I'm gonna open up the general session with a presentation. And I'm actually gonna start with this topic of the process that I use to help my clients drill down into what's most important. So if you're interested in that, you might wanna stick around. Uh, and then I would say some of the key things to think about, and this is where small gardens, where it is a little bit more challenging. There's three things that I think are important. And the first one is scale and proportion. And scale is really about how a space relates to a fixed object. And so in your garden, that fixed object is really you. How does your garden relate to you? And what can happen in a small space is that um, the scale of the things that we choose is either too small or too big. And like a good example is small gardens are often very concerned with privacy planting and privacy screening. But if you put up you know, a 40 foot high wall of Italian cypress, that scale is off. That's gonna make you feel really small and like your garden is looming. And the flip side to that, and what I see a lot is the thought that because the space is small, everything in it needs to be small. And an easy example for that is sometimes I'll be at a client consultation and we'll be talking about you know, containers or they'll show me their containers. And there's a tendency to think that because your patio is small, your containers should be really small too. But what happens if you do that is you just wind up with a space that's very cluttered. You know, And this is again, more about proportion. Bigger is almost always better. So like one big container instead of three or four or five or six little ones is gonna give you a space that's not cluttered, but that feels really cozy. And um, if you're a plant lover, you're thinking, but I need five containers because <laughs> I need all my plants. But, you know, just be a plant crammer. That's what I do. You know, just shove in as many as you possibly can. Um, circulation is important. Circulation just refers to how easy it is to move through the space. And that's not just things like pathways, you know, making sure they're in the right place and they get where you need to go and they're wide enough. But it's also just about, you know, maneuvering around your patio, making sure that you leave enough room when you buy furniture to get around it. Um, making sure if you have things like posts because you have a shade structure that you, um, you know, try to arrange that in a way that you don't block your best views. So again, a little harder in a small garden, but not impossible. And then the last thing is, uh, and you will not see this in a design principle anywhere, this is for me personally, which is comfort. Think about what makes you comfortable in the garden. Make sure your furniture is comfortable. Make sure that you don't have a garden that's so um, hard to take care of that when you're in it, all you think about is your maintenance chores. You know, So comfort, I'd say, was, would be my third but most important suggestion. These are fantastic. And I think we all have been on someone's deck where they <laughs> crammed a too large patio table and chairs there and you try and move your seat back a little bit and boom, you're off that deck. Uh -huh. <laughs> so these are great things to keep in mind. Um, can you offer hope to someone with a tiny space, perhaps a little more than a small patio that they can create a garden there? Uh, you know what, I can do that because I've actually done that a few times for myself in my own garden. And I think what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna switch over to a screen share and I wanna, I thought it would be really fun since I got this question, I knew it was coming up in advance to give you a little before and after um, of a small courtyard that I designed in Pleasant Hill. So I'm gonna switch over right now, if that's okay, everyone.
And Jackie, am I up? Yes, that okay. looks great. Fantastic. All right, so this is an illustration of my client Debbie's courtyard in Pleasant Hill. And it's very small, it's only 12 by 16. And actually when Debbie first contacted me, I, I actually, I thought it was because I was, you know, getting this great reputation for small space design, but it turned out that nobody else was interested in her project because it was so small. So here are some of the before pictures. And so you can see that there's a couple of challenges that we needed to address. And the first one is that the courtyard, it was just really small and cramped. She had neighbors on all sides. So just finding space for everything, you know, finding space for the plants and for the seating was a challenge. Um, the second thing is, is that this is her primary view outside of her living room door. It's a blank wall and worse because this is not her wall. She's in a condo. Um, the HOA would not allow us to attach anything. So that was another challenge we had to deal with. And then finally, she has this, you know, major eyesore in the AC unit that we also had to deal with. And overall, Debbie just really wanted to have it feel less like like an outdoor courtyard and more like an extension of the home, more like an outdoor room. So we wanted to try to reinforce that connection to the house. So let's talk about the first goal. You know, the idea that you want a space to feel cozy instead of cramped. And a good way to do this is with what I call diagonal design. And in this case, we added the diagonal in a couple of different ways. You can see it in the floor. Um, where the tile is laid on the diagonal. And then we also did it with the furniture that we laid at a 45 degree angle. And um, I actually do this with anytime I have a square patio, if we're doing some sort of a shape like this, this is a great way to, to de-emphasize and break up that boxiness. Um, you'll also see that the tile is large. These are 16 inch tiles. And that really gets back to what I talked about previously that bigger often is better. You know, a smaller pattern can make a space feel a little bit cramped. And basically, you know, if you like this idea, but you're not redoing your tile or you don't want to redo it, you can get the same effect by just laying um, like an outdoor rug on the diagonal. So um, this is, again, another picture just showing how we lay things on the diagonal. The, the other thing to think about if you want to get the sense of an outdoor room is to choose fabrics that are more indicative of what you would have inside. So usually I like the furniture to just be a plain fabric, not have like a flower pattern on it. And just like you would inside, you can always use cushions and things like that to bring in a little bit of pop of extra color and pattern. And then the second way that we added a cozy effect was by kind of layering lush plantings all around the edge of the garden. And because the space was so small, I actually did take the hardscape all the way up to the edge. And I decided to rely 100% on containers because it's easier to get a layered look if you can actually start the plants at different heights in the garden. Um, you can also get that layered effect better in a small space with containers because you can kind of pull some out in front of others. You can kind of layer in two different directions. Um, so containers are a great option if your space is short, they're gonna give you more flexibility. In her case, uh, we were inspired by her favorite vacation spot, which is Hawaii. And so to minimize that impact, I focused more on foliage than I did on flower color because you're gonna get a much longer season of color that way. Um, in this case, we used some um, perennial canna, and then this is just annual potato vine. And um, for this spot, I do like flowers though, where there was only room for one plant we brought in, because this is a nice tall, narrow space, what I like to call a see-through plant, something that is tall, but doesn't have a lot of density. So you get the flowers, but you don't feel crammed. And then that other issue, you know, what are we gonna do about that big blank wall? Well, because we couldn't attach anything, we just found a very inexpensive trellis online and we had our contractor bolt it to the ground. And so that really created this amazing frame that we could do all kinds of fun things with. So that's a great solution for you if you don't wanna attach things to the wall. And then this is when the garden was first planted. So you can see the vines haven't grown very much, but another advantage to a small space, particularly one that's enclosed like this one, is if you add fragrance to the garden, it, it really traps that fragrance. So in this case, I layered two different vines, um, star jasmine to get that beautiful fragment, fra blah, fragrance, and then also just some uh, clematis so I could get you know, a little bit of blue to cool down all those hot colors. And then finally, the way that we resolved the eyesore of the AC unit is the contractor built a surround that actually is vented. 
And then this is, um, uh, what do you call that, trap door? What do you call that when something opens up? So normally the seating isn't here and this is up so that the AC can still circulate during the day. But at night, if Debbie has a party, she can push this down and she can create extra seating. And I would say if you do this, um, we actually consulted with an HVAC professional. So you wouldn't want to do this um, just all on your own DIY. You want to make sure that you don't do anything to impede the unit. And then another option for extra seating because the set that she came with had an extra chair. We, you know, we went ahead and we blocked this particular gate because she almost never uses it. You know, and you can always move that seat when you have to. So to recap, um, diagonal design techniques are a great way to break up a cozy space and there's different, or pardon me, a small space and there's different ways to bring that in. Um, for very narrow spaces, Layering with containers can be easier than planting in the ground. Um, always make sure that you emphasize foliage because you're gonna get a much longer lasting season than you will from flowers and fragrance is also great in a small space. Um, indoor touches can really help make an outside space feel more like a room to relax in. And then the last piece is just try to be creative with your eyesores. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this share. That was wonderful. I love before and afters, and that was particularly wonderful. You are coming over to my house next, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I've got to show right after this. <laughs> well, we've got some other uh, really good questions. Um, James, one of our headliners, was wondering about vertical gardening, um, living walls, vertical gardening, all of that stuff, and is wondering if you have any um, books you might suggest on the topic. Uh, well, James, that's an excellent question. I would like to start out by recommending my own book. Um, the first book that I wrote at some time ago, we, uh, I co-wrote it with Rebecca Sweet, and it was when living walls were really starting to hit the market. And so we had one of the first books out on that, and it is called Smart Vertical Gardening for Small and Large Spaces. Um, it is very design focused. So if that's not really what you're looking for, if you're thinking more like you wanna uh, grow vegetables, then probably a better book for you would be Vertical Gardening by Derek Fell. And that's, um, that's, that came out not that long after our book, so it's been a while, but it's very much considered a classic. Um, and then the third thing, this isn't a book, but um, I mentioned that I had, I actually recorded a presentation and then I'll be doing live Q&A afterwards for the uh, Frederick Meyer Garden in Michigan. And that presentation is free and it's open to the public. And that is going to be this coming Tuesday at four o'clock. So if you go to the uh, Frederick Meyer website, if you go to my website, there's a link as well. And um, you can actually sign up for that. Wonderful. Uh, Sue, this is so funny. You're Susan and we have like 400 questions from people also named Susan. Just want to assure the headliners that Susan did not provide her own questions here. This is a, a legit other Sue. Uh, she says she, re try that. <laughs> she recently added two small planting areas on her patio, which gets some morning sun. And she's wondering uh, what kind of plant suggestions you might have and what your thoughts are on how often she should be watering. Well, um, so as I said previously on the question about planning, um, I am in the second part of the presentation, I'm gonna share a lot of my favorite small space plants. So I'm not gonna go into that too much. And also in case you don't stick around for that, Sue, they're also um, on the handout. Uh, but I do wanna address the irrigation question because this comes up a lot. And I'm, first of all, I'm probably gonna disappoint you by saying I can't give you a completely straight answer but these are the things that you need to look at to determine what your irrigation should be. And the first one is it depends on the water needs of the plants that you're planting. So at this point in time, most of us are either have drought tolerant gardens or we're transitioning to low water gardens. But if that's not the case for you, then you know obviously your garden is gonna need more water. And that also, um, if you're planting a new space, you really wanna make sure that you are planting like plants together. So if you want a low water garden, everything really needs to be low water. Um, the second thing to consider in terms of how long you should be irrigating is are you using overhead spray, which is really only a good choice for lawns or for big swaths of ground cover. If you're using drip, that's going to be a much better choice. But even with drip, there's not a completely clear answer because it really depends on um, how, what your emitter rate is. 
And I think the number one thing that confuses people when they make that transition from having a lawn and being accustomed to spray and moving over to drip is that with spray, spray is calculated in gallons per minute and drip is calculated in gallons per hour, which means it's really, really slow. So oftentimes people are used to running their lawn irrigation for five minutes or 10 minutes and then they switch over to drip and they run it for 15 or 20. And then that's usually not enough time for that water to really get down. So there are some online tools that can help you um, figure it out. But I would say start out with watering for a longer period of time if it's drip and you know maybe starting at 30 minutes and then if the plants look happy, you know, you're, no, you're on the right track. If you start to get some wilt, you know, you need to more likely encourage the, the amount of time you're watering more than watering more often. Makes total sense. Just as a side note, when, when one isn't DIYing it, when one is hiring a, a landscape designer, for example, that's the kind of advice you're also going to get from them, right? Something specific to those plants. Yes. Right. So yes, and so from a design standpoint, when I do a design for someone, I don't um, provide an irrigation plan because uh, a, a competent contractor doesn't need me to tell them, you know, here's where you should lay the lateral pipe or whatever. But I do provide a hydrozone plan, and so what I do is on the plan, I will circle the areas and I'll say these plants are all low water, full sun, and so the contractor knows they all can go on the same zone, and these plants are all moderate water, you know, part shade. And so the contractor knows that as well. And then usually if you're just doing something simple, so if your gardener is doing it, or if you do more complicated things, which is what I usually design, the contractor will initially set the program, the uh, program for you. And you know, I, I should also probably mention, um, I have one of these, I always put them in my notes. If you haven't heard of it before, and Sue, you'll love this, there's something called a smart controller, and it's also called an ET controller. You guys have maybe talked about this in previous talks, um, but what that does is you can program it, and it uses weather station data, or else you install a little weather station on your site, so it knows, okay, it's really hot today, I need to increase the amount that I water. And so that can be, you still have to, it won't do everything. <laughs> you know, you still have to tell it some things, but it's a really good way, not only to help make sure that you water enough, but um, to make sure that you don't overwater because more people are overwatering than underwatering. And it can really help you uh, cut back on your water bill. And in fact, Contra Costa Water isn't doing this right now, but East Bay Mud will give you a rebate if you install a smart controller. So that's a plus too. Oh, that's great. I am a... Uh serial murderer of plants by drowning. <laughs> this is when I really miss Joan on these things. I'm listening to all this like, oh, I had no idea. No, that sounds very cool. Thank you. Um, another Susan asks, uh, she lives in the La Marinda area and she's interested in firescape landscaping, uh, Lafayette, Moraga and Arinda, which uh, La Marindans call La Marinda, is in a high risk wildfire urban interface. So she's wondering how to protect her home by what she plants. Yeah, um, it, that, it, it's challenging. And you know, one of the things that I have learned is that sustainability is really tricky. And so like if you, if you uh, plan your garden around one thing like fire safety, oftentimes if you did it the way that the Moraga Arenda Fire District wanted you to do it, you would have nothing but rocks and lawn because they don't care about water usage. They just want nothing to burn. So it is a little bit challenging. I would say the first thing to do is, and you, if you're in the area, you probably already know this, but for other people, this is really helpful. Um, the Moraga Arenda Fire District, District has a prohibited plant list. So as you start to put your garden together, you're always gonna wanna refer to that and check and make sure that you're not bringing in something that you can't have. Um, what's a little bit more helpful, I think, is that, um, I think it's called the, uh, the Moraga Safety Council, something like that, Aaron, I think I might've given that link to you, is um, they have a list of plants that you can use. And so that can also be a good start point for you to you know, figure out what works for you. Um, to, and, and in terms of like specifically what plants you should be doing or including, it's hard for me to know because I would do something completely different on a slope than I would in a backyard or that I would in a front yard. But there are a couple of plants that I like because they, there's a lot of variety in what you can get. And you're probably familiar with manzanita. 
and um, it's very good for fire safety. It's pretty good for deer. Sometimes they will nibble at it though. And you can get, you know, small tree shapes, you can get mid-side shrubs, you can get ground cover. So it's really a very versatile and flexible plant. Uh, I also like, um, I also like rock rose. Rock, manzanita is great, but it takes a really long time. So I always like to balance that with some things that are gonna give more instant gratification. Rock rose comes in a ground cover form. It also comes in a, um, and like a more shrub form and it grows really fast. So you get some of that instant gratification um, right away. And of course, succulents are always a great choice because they hold so much water in their leaves that um, they will, you know, they, they won't burn. Great. We've got time for one more quick question um, in this portion. Uh, Patricia asks, why doesn't my wisteria ever bloom? Prolific growth, no flowers. Yes, that is so frustrating. Well, Patricia, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to give you some things that it might be. Um, one is, I'm not, it depends on how old your wisteria is. Some plants do take longer before they flower for the first time, and wisteria is one of those. So it could just be a case of waiting it out. Um, the second thing that can be, an, it might not be getting enough sun. Some plants are more sensitive than others. They need really, you know, at, at least six hours of sun to bloom, and wisteria is a bit sun sensitive that way. Um, and then the third thing is uh, you might be killing it with kindness because what sometimes happens, and this is also really common with um, bougainvillea when that plant doesn't grow, is if, there's, if you're giving it uh, too much nitrogen in particular, nitrogen makes things green. And so plants to some extent produce flowers, that's a stress result because they need to propagate and they're worried, okay, well, maybe we're gonna die soon, so let's put out some flowers. So if you keep giving it nitrogen and things that make it really happy and make it grow, it thinks it's gonna live forever and it doesn't really have any reason to do anything about that. I doubt you have too much nitrogen in your soil naturally, just because um, it's water soluble, meaning every time it rains or you water, the nitrogen goes away. So if you are using a fertilizer, um, typically that first number is the nitrogen and I would switch to something that doesn't have any nitrogen in it at all. And there's something, I think it's, uh, there's an organic brand called DTE and the numbers on it are zero, three, zero. So the middle number is phosphorus and that helps plants bloom. So if, and it's organic. Um, and so you might wanna try that and see if that, you know, gives you a little bit more success. 